Originally starting, I was a COD hater and I was like addicted to Halo. If you want to get to the top, you got to be ready to sacrifice it all. It's around like 8-ish AM, I think, something like that. We wake up to gunshots. They're shooting. They're emptying the clip. It's literally the room next to us. Bullets could have literally came through the wall probably. Thank you very much, Price Pick, for sponsoring this video. Make sure you do check out Price Picks. You have a variety of sports. I've got NFL here. I've got NBA. I've got football, not soccer, football. If traditional sports is not your thing, you can also do CSGO, Dota 2. COD will be on there. Make sure you do check out Price Picks. Basically, what you do is you, you pick uh, a category. You can say, okay, is this player going to get more than a certain amount of kills? Yes, no. You put your uh, pick onto that. So what you want to do, guys, is you want to go to price picks. You want to use referral code breaking point and you will get your first deposit matched up to $100. Yes, code breaking point for the new COD season. Get your first deposit matched up to $100. Easy money. Start betting. Start you know, doing what you got to do today. Loads of different choice, guys. Check it out. Hey, guys, make sure you sign up to the NYSL Battle Pass. Make sure you get your points and redeem them for rewards. NYSL.io. You can save up your points in different tiers. Platinum, diamond, bronze, silver, gold. Save up your points. You can even save up for this cardigan. If you wanted more, you can save up for an NYSL-themed PC. Or you can meet the team and have dinner with us whenever you want. Make sure you get rewarded for your support, nysl.io. Save up your points, redeem them, join the battle pass. Born in LA, you started on Halo, but you also studied chemical engineering. Yes, sir. How did that come about? And do you have any aspirations in trying to finish that? So for me, when I was going to school, my dad was always telling me, like, don't go to school for something that I could teach you, like business or something yeah. like my dad's a businessman. Mm -hmm. So then he was like, I was like, all right, I guess I'll do like something in STEM. And that was the plan. And when I went in, chemistry just ended up being my favorite subject. Yep. So I was like, all right, I guess I'll roll with this. And everyone I told I was doing it, they're like, yo, like, this is a big, this is like a big, like, undertaking. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You got to lock in for this. <laughs> and it was definitely hard. Some of the hardest classes I've ever taken was during that process. And yep. juggling that with competing was crazy. But for now, I definitely don't have any aspirations to go back because I took such a long break that yep. if I went back, I want to remember 90% of the stuff. So then let's talk about your parents. So your dad's yeah. a businessman. Was your dad typically Asian in a sense where it was, you have to study, 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 oh, study, yeah, study. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then just for the viewers that are watching who may be in the same situation with their mom and dad, how did you balance a very difficult STEM uh, subject in chemical yeah. engineering and competing at the, you were, you were still competing at a very good level. Yeah. How did you balance both? Man, it's, it's, it's like a, it's honestly a test your drive and it tests your character because you gotta, you gotta show how bad you want it because when your parents like, like are my parents old school and you know, they want to take that proper route of education and you know, all those formalities yeah. that you have to prove to them that you can do both. They wouldn't let me get out of school and go into the gaming thing full time because that was so risky at the time. Like, yeah. Gaming wasn't like a career. It wasn't a real thing. There was no couldn't make real money or do anything like that so for me what i was doing was i was going to school i was never missed class if i missed class it'd be a problem yes and then i'd game all day and then at night do my homework like till super late so you have to sacrifice something and for me the sacrifice was sleep yeah and a lot of like social activity because you can't waste the time on that when you have goals that you need to accomplish so so is that how you balance both yeah sacrificing the sleep sacrificing yeah. social. so what was in your mind becoming a pro player what was one of the biggest sacrifices you've made I feel like everything. Like if you want to get to the top, you got to be ready to sacrifice it all. Like I've missed so many family events, so many big memories, so many, like so much sleep, so much comfort, all like the easiness of, you know, just coasting by and whatever you're doing. You have to sacrifice all that and you have to be ready to be uncomfortable because yep. it's going to be a difficult road. And if you don't, if you're not prepared for that, then you're not going to make it to the top because there's a kid out there that's going to sacrifice more than you to get that goal. You know? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So then we'll talk about your parents again. When was the moment, if there is a moment, that yeah. your mom and dad were like, okay, have our blessing. Yeah. This can be a viable career for yeah. you. Go do it. When was that it moment was during for you? World War II. So okay. World War II, I, when I won my tournament, my first tournament ever, I was still in school actually. And then I won that tournament and I was like, Super hype. My family is, of course, happy for me. Yeah. But I think the picture is still on my Twitter if you go far down in my media. It's like my dad texts me like, yeah, congrats, good win, but school's still more important, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I just won the tournament, got MVP. My dad knew what I was going to be getting at. Like, yo, like, look, let me try to get out of this. Yeah. Um, and then when I won the next tournament, again, back to back, it was like a month later. Then I finally convinced him, like, hey, like, let me get some time off. Like, if I can do this while I'm in school, imagine what I could do full time. So then he was like, all right, like you could take one semester off, then summer's going to come up after summer. Yeah. You got to start back up again. I was like, all right, I'm done. And I haven't looked back since. Was it, was it difficult to convince him? Because if oh, I yeah. did that to my dad, I'm not, I, I don't yeah. think I'm ever convincing him. You got to do this degree. Yeah. You got to do it now. Yeah. It was super difficult. I mean, it was, ne- I did, it was a long shot. I just yeah. went for it. And then eventually, I guess he felt bad for me because I had been asking him for so long. And then I finally won some tournaments. He's like, all right, like one semester, you get a few months off. Yeah see what happens from there. And then I just haven't looked back since. <laughs> and they're still on me to this day. To this day, to they're on me. Yeah, yeah, they want me to go back. And I'm like, it's been like 10 years. <laughs> so then would you, would you ever go into business with your dad? Oh, yeah, for sure. That's, yeah. that's a big part of the plan mm-hmm. when, I'm, when I'm done playing uh, is because, you know, my dad's older. I'm, my dad's an older gentleman. I don't want him to be yeah. running the businesses forever. So yeah. whenever I'm done and I have the opportunity to be back home, you know, I want to take that pressure off his shoulders and, you know, let him rest. He's worked so hard his whole life for yeah. our family that he deserves the opportunity to just, you know, pass off the torch Absolutely. and go to. Do, do the work for him, make sure yeah. he's in a good position, retire him. Yeah. I appreciate that. So speaking of your chemical engineering degree or um, classes that you were taking, what was, did you find any learnings from that that translated over to COD? Because Ooh. we had APG on for the yeah. last episode. And yeah. when he was in school, he mentioned there was a lot of things that he took when it came to researching, when it came to balancing, scheduling, even when it came to pod work that he took from his classes. Yeah. Was there anything that you took from chemical engineering? Because that is, like you mentioned, yeah. very difficult. The biggest thing for me that was like, it wasn't necessarily a direct translation from chemical engineering to COD. It was more of a translation from school to COD. The, the soft skills. Yeah, the, the s- things you learn in school. Mm-hmm. School teaches you how to learn. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So like, Taking that process and applying it to COD is what helped me like learn COD. Because there's a lot of people that watch VOD or play or and all that stuff and they just don't know how to actually learn and yeah. like how to improve or how to grasp the concepts. Mm. But going through school and going through these hard classes teaches you how to do that. And that's what I was applying to COD. Is there one piece of advice you'd give to the next generation? Mm, you're giving up my secrets, huh? <laughs> no, I mean, just, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> now, what I would say... I'll, I'll, this is for me. This is me writing this down. This is for the boys' next, next vault session. <laughs> what I would say is um, you have to... The biggest thing for me is like when I'm coming into the VOD and learning from, learning from that is like being active in the VOD process and that. Yeah. Don't just be like watching the arrows. There's like a cause and effect. You have to find the correlations, the patterns, and all these things is... Speaking my language. <laughs> <laughs> like there's a cause and effect. There's like a, there's a cue, there's a signal, there's something, there's patterns that you're going to pick up on that once you do that, you start seeing the game in a different way. Yeah. And once you ma- master those, COD, no matter what game it is, what map it is, yeah. what spawns, what, it becomes simple. And then that's how you can continuously like progress. Lesson number one of the Abedi fundamental <laughs> school. <laughs> okay. Memorize the patterns, man. There you go. So. We'll move on um, just to your upbringing. Yeah. How did you get into COD? And then how did you get into competitive specific? Yeah. So for me, honestly, it was, it was like a movie. You couldn't, you couldn't write it. What kind it, of movie were you talking about? <laughs> it was a good movie. It was, it was a good, good movie. movie. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah. So originally starting, I was a COD hater. And I was like addicted to Halo. Yeah. I was like, yo, no COD, this and that. I went to my cousin's house, super close to my family. I went to my cousin's house. I was like, yo, I got this new game called Duty. I'm like, bro. Yeah, in my face with that. Like, I'm playing with Halo. <laughs> and then I still remember to this day, my first game on ever was Downpour on Call of Duty 4. Right. And I was using an RPD and I was dropping bombs. I was dropping bombs <laughs> and I was like, yo, I'm kind of built for this, you know? So then 
I got like hooked on it at that point, you know, 10th prestige, 55, all of that. And at the time I was going to private Muslim school. Yeah. So I transferred schools in seventh grade. And the first kid that I sat next to on my first day of school. Yeah. Became friends, became friends with him that day. And he's like, yo, like you play COD. And I'm like, I play COD, bro. (laughs) For sure. So I get his gamer tag and all that and go home. He adds me. He's like, yo, let's play one-on-one. We play one-on-one and I like absolutely destroy him. And then he's the one that tells me, yo, have you heard of game battles? I'm like, bro, what are you talking about? Like, what's that? And then he he made my account for me and I still use that account to this day. Yeah. That's my account. He made the account for me. He's like, yes, yeah, this website you could play against other people and all this other stuff. And at that time, I thought I was the best in the world. I was like, bro, I'm going to every lobby dropping 100. No yeah. one's better than me. Then I got there and I was like, wait, I'm not the best. <laughs> I'm not the best. <laughs> there's, there's levels to Yeah, this there's people better than me actually. There's people doing this. So then that's kind of what got the itch going and got the hook of like, I want to be the best. I want to play these people that are better than me and see where I stack up. Fair enough. Can I, I just want to bring up something that you mentioned. You went to a private Islamic school. Yeah. What was that like? So did you then end up transferring over to like a, a public school? A, like a public huge school. public school. So what was the differences like for oh, people that won't know? It was a different planet because my the private school I went to yeah. was like kindergarten to eighth grade mm-hmm. and there was less than 100 kids in the entire school. Yeah. So I'm used to like in my classroom, it's a teacher, five, six students maybe 12 if there's like other kids in there, like from a different grade that are like working on something else. Yeah. And I went from that to like a big public school where there's 50 kids in the class with only one teacher, all this chaos, commotion, all these different like perspectives on life and different views and just different everything. So it was like a culture shock to me. I was like, whoa, this is a big deal, (laughs) you know? Were were they the schools that you had to stay in? Like you stay over a, Oh, no, no, it wasn't a boarding school. No, boarding no, no. School. Okay. Yeah, so I would just go there every day. And it was, so it was like 30 minutes away from my house. Feel bad for my parents. They drove me every morning, wow. 30 minutes away. Hour back in traffic every day for like from kindergarten to sixth grade. Yeah. And so then what were some of the big differences when you mentioned the culture shock? Yeah. What were some of the big differences between your private school and the public school? Because I imagine you do a lot about like Arabic and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So in the school, we went to school in a uniform every day. Yeah. We'd have like, We'd have prayer in the middle of the day. Like I was surrounded by all the people that understood my world. Yeah. You know what I mean? They came from the same world. They're all Mm -hmm. religious, everything like that. And um, the way we operated was just different. It was more conservative. It was like the another big part of it was the teacher had focus on the kids because there's one teacher and like six kids. So like you had I was I felt like a genius at that time. (laughs) You know what I mean? Because like I had the teacher could focus on the students really well. So it was very, very different. No one's messing around really in class, yeah. like because it's such a small community that you start messing around. You're gonna see your parents be like, "Yo, what's this guy doing?" You know, <laughs> what was the discipline like? Because when I when I went to I went yeah. to something similar. I would if I didn't say like a particular word right in Arabic yeah. or a verse right. Yeah. Slap! I'm, I'm getting. <laughs> I, he's got a big stick and he's hitting me right. And this was I was like seven or eight at the time yeah so what was that like was there was, was <laughs> there was no discipline like that at the school but you know if you would have started acting up the discipline would have came later you know what I mean? people are probably listening to this yeah. like, what the hell yeah. <laughs> okay uh but yeah so other than that when it came to when you went to the public school yeah and you're meeting all these you i say i see new types of different cultures yeah and very like different that. it was yeah. very very different so what was one of the the biggest, I guess, differences when it came from? One thing that I kind of clocked right away was the level of like, I guess, disrespect that kids right. were giving in the classroom. Like it was noisy, teachers telling them to be quiet, no one's stopping, there's people messing around. I'm like, yo, like teacher said quiet. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not I'm ready. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, so like it was just uh it's hard for one person to control the room of 50 yeah. kids, you know? So it just registering all that was like a big change to me. And then I kind of like started picking up on what I could get away with. You know what I mean? I started becoming a little more like, oh, Stop okay. Stop pushing the boundaries. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because once you're like, uh, once you break free from like a certain box, I guess you could say, you start realizing, oh, I, I could get away with this and this and this. That box gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So like, you know, eventually, you know, you, you start picking up on stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They sound like some of the boys that we, uh, we work with. Yeah. Pushing the boundaries. Yeah. Today. Can I be a minute late? Two yeah. minutes late? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no. You see what you get away with? See the repercussions? Like, oh, nothing happens here. All right, bet. Let's see what's going on. Now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, okay, so let's let's talk back more about your card. So, how did you get into uh, competitive? Yeah, so once that guy showed me the game battles website, mm-hmm. I started playing with him and my friends from school, and quickly realized that they're not good. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So as we were going, uh, eventually I started. I sketched on them and got on like better teams. Yeah, and then living like a Hannah Montana life, I told them that I was like done playing, kind of. So they all stopped. Okay. They all st- like thought I was done. But when in you reality, say they, you mean your mom and dad? No, 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 my friends. Oh, your friends. I was playing with you. I told okay. them I was done. Yeah. So then I was like, I'm not really playing anymore or whatever. But in reality, I was just sketching on them and started playing with other people. Um, and then they no one knew I was a gamer. Like, yeah. at that point, after I was done, like, I kept it a super secret. It was literally, I was at tournaments and doing this and whatever. But I was just telling them, oh, I'm sick. Or, I can't hang out. Oh, wow, okay. Whatever. Yeah, it was super, super top secret for me. Because at the time, you were like a nerd if you like play games. Yes. You know what I'm saying? I didn't want to be seen as some nerdy guy so i had that as like my secret and then going on from there i found out like there's land events mm-hmm. like went from online matches to tournaments to land events and i begged my dad for like years like two years at least to get to go to my first tournament and it got to the point where people in the community like i had a name for myself at the community at this point like i was like a top am and whatnot yeah but i could never go to the lands and it got to the point where people believed that i just couldn't travel because there was people like that at that time that yeah. just couldn't travel. So they were like, there's no point in playing with this guy. Like, he can't travel. So I would join Team Scrim, dominate. Tournament comes up. Later, guys. Yeah, I like, can't <laughs> you were sketching. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Wow. laughs> exactly. That happened a lot. <laughs> you, were, you were dodging lands. Oh, my yeah. God. That was like, uh, it, was, it was just crazy because I wanted it so bad. But at the time, I was such a young kid. My dad's yeah. like, you're not flying across the country at 14 15 to go play a video game in some like what are you saying go sit down I, I go think, read a book you know yeah I mean? no i think that's the same thing with everyone's parents because my parents were the same way. Yeah, yeah did did your dad end up traveling to your first event with you yeah you he, he finally caved in i was begging him like i said for two years i was begging him every every event that was coming up yeah eventually when it came up again i was like please like just take me let me go to this tournament he's like all right you've asked me enough i'm gonna take you to this one tournament yeah so you can see that it's just a waste of time you can scratch the itch and then you'll be done with it Little did he know that that just made the itch way bigger. <laughs> like, I'll scratch it everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Scratch it everywhere. Yeah. Okay, let's let's move on into more of a nuanced topic. So as you've progressed in your career, yeah. you're now this community, you're now known as a leader of the card. Naturally, the more experience you get with the teams that you're playing. A leader to AG, to Dante, to Mac, all yeah. of these different kids now. My question to you is what does leadership mean to you? What is leadership in your view? Caught me off guard with that one. That was actually really good. And I've done a good amount of podcasts and no one's ever hit me with that. It's you. We could go back to it. It's fine. No, no, no. I, I want to answer that one. It's you made making me think, you know? I think for me, what leadership means is instilling belief and a unified front. Okay. So being that leader means you have to bring that energy into the room to get everyone in the room to buy in fully and have that unified energy of actually being a cohesive unit so doing whatever you can whether it's in the game out of the game on an emotional level on a personal level to bring that aura and like that vibe to the team and the room yeah but what do you mean specifically when you say energy? like do you mean to be this your leadership as this, I have to bring this hype energy this, no. this. so what does that mean it's not you? the hype energy it's the it's the energy of like you could just tell you've been on championship team clearly yeah. you could tell when you walk in the room you could tell when you're, you're with the people and you're hanging out and you're interacting like yeah. you could feel the aura of like what a team is yes and that's the type of aura that as a leader you have to try to replicate the trust always the belief yeah yes. exactly so like i said whether it's the coming from the game planning in the game or yeah. just the emotional connections you form with them individually and make them form with each other and all that that is like what i mean leadership. yeah there's there's often i don't know if you agree but I think there's often this romance of perception. If you're going to be a leader, you need to be spoken, brash, nah. this high energy. You know, nah. when you see clips in NFL, the coach yeah. is like smacking a, a bottle over his head or something yeah, like that. Yeah. There's often I'm not on that vibe at all. Yeah, so yeah. I, I agree with you. I was going to ask you, so then what do you view? How, what's your leadership style? So if I, if I talk to accuracy, I'm not talking to Lamar, I'm yeah. talking to accuracy. Yeah. What is that leadership style that you have? Um, let's say with Minnesota or let's say with Seattle. Yeah. So, hmm. 
that's a good question because I would say the style is more. I feel like it's calm, cool, and collected. Yeah, but it's also like very serious and intense. It's not like high energy, but it's serious, intense, but like mellow. If that makes sense, you、yeah. know what I mean. So that's kind of the vibe that I feel like I bring. And then, of course, don't get me wrong, I definitely have my moments、yeah. <laughs> where the other side comes out because you have to.、Yeah. The olive branch doesn't always work, you know. <laughs> so, like that, you have to pick and choose, you know, what type of energy you need to bring for the situation. So, just jumping on that, yeah. How do you think that's changed over the years? It's changed a lot because earlier on, I would say CWL. Into very early CDL, you could kind of get away with、uh, being more mean, I guess you could say, and、yeah. that's something that I had to learn as I got older and through that process. Is you could be more like, I guess, aggressive, more of that energy that you were saying, like that point, louder and all like, like all like that kind of energy, more、yeah. of aggressive energy, and trying to drag out the best out of people. But as the years went on. Maybe it was just a generational change, or like the player change, or just more professionalism in the league that that kind of phased out. And if you're doing that too much, it can like do more harm than good. Yeah. So you have to I had to find that balance as the years went on, like learn how to control that. So then, would you say? And I know this is opinion held by some of the old heads. Yeah. Would you say kids have gone softer nowadays? Yeah, for sure. For、uh, that, that's just a fact. That's、yeah. just a fact. Because for me, when I was coming up and playing. It was people were on your head, you know、yeah. what I mean. People were on your head, and now, like, if you do that too much, especially because so many of the people that are coming in the league are so young and fresh, and just it's just a different generation that they grew up in and、yeah. different lifestyle and everything. So it can it can really like do a lot of more damage than good. Yeah. So yeah. so with your leadership style, because you recognized that there is a generational shift. Yeah. With this new generation, they're not as I would say hard headed as the、yeah. old. So、yeah. you have to adapt. Change based yeah, on hundred percent based on who yeah hundred percent you have you have to change on who you have and like you have to be able to form that emotional connection with these people because if you don't it's all just BS in the air like that real connection that you form with them is what instills that belief and that like energy and that、yeah. importance if it's just you're just showing up to the room clocking in like you're working at some normal place and、yeah. just clocking out is it's never gonna work so then. When it comes to the CDL versus CDL, yeah, that's been hot topic. Have you noticed any changes outside, obviously, the franchise? When it comes to performance-wise, yeah, what's been the biggest change going from CWL、yeah. to CDL? Because there was a whole thing with Octane, and、yeah. saying you know, the ceilings every year get higher and higher and higher. But for someone that's actually played there, yeah, what's been the biggest change for you? For me, I think that nowadays the talent level is. Exponentially higher than before than CWL, but the difference for me is maybe it's the games, or maybe it's the players that are in the league now. I feel like people made less mistakes in the older, yeah. So like, in the older games, people made less mistakes, and like the game was more consistent. So maybe、yeah. that's a big part of it too, because the game the pods have changed a lot over the、yes. years, but. Now there's just people that are so talented that like they're getting these crazy kills, crazy bailouts. Maybe they don't understand the game as well to like a finite like、yes. pinpoint level, but they're just godlike, so it doesn't like impact it as much. So I think the game's a lot scrappier and messier now than it was before. Yeah, I agree. I think to your point, I was thinking about this, and I don't know if you did also agree, but yeah, the talent every year gets higher, higher.、Yeah. You now have coaches. Analysts, all of these, the games played at a quicker pace, yeah, to a fundamental level. Everyone、yeah. has that experience, whatever. But to your point, especially, let's look at World War Two. Game was consistent. Yeah, you get you you spawn in a certain place, you get put in a trap. You need to use teamwork to get out. It's yeah, yeah. it's gonna be difficult to yeah, just exactly bail yourself out. Yeah, I feel like now the games have gone quicker and quicker and quicker. It's more there's less of a consistent logic to them. Let's say、yeah. hardpoint specifically. Yeah. You can use talent to build yourself out、yeah. of situations. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. But the talent is still getting higher and higher. Yeah. But I look at the teamwork aspect. Just my opinion is becoming is becoming less reliant、yeah. on teamwork. Exactly. So that's what's changing the game a lot. Like that. That's why you see these teams where they and people talk like you just need a talent stack. You need to. Yeah. Of course, you need a certain threshold of talent to even compete with like、yeah. the good teams. Hundred percent. But 
But the real needle mover, I feel like, is that teamwork. Because yeah. the teamwork level is going down, if you're the team that has teamwork, you can stand out even further. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's a big difference for me. And, bro, when I watch old VOD, when I watch matches now, including probably my own team, too, like, you watch matches now? Bro, there's people not watching the pinch. Yes. There's, like, so many mistakes happening where it's, like, yo, like, what? like what? how did this happen? Like, what do you mean? If you watch older cars, I feel like that happened a lot less. Even even in the micro situations, I remember this situation screaming new World War II champs. Yeah. He was TK. He was St. Mary Dumont. I remember this vividly. I was ironing. Uh, this was E3. Yeah. You had the tower you're coming through. Yeah. And you, you guys threw two stones over and you guys were there. Yeah. I have never been baited and switched and Amos is dragged <laughs> so fucking hard. Yeah. I think it was, I think it was, I think you were with Ken at the time. Yeah. He did a, he slid to the, uh, he like jumped or like uh, dolphin, dolphin dive yeah. to the tank. I'm shooting that guy. You peak at the same time. Yeah. Teams don't set up stuff like that nearly as much, as much yeah. on these recent games. Yeah. And I've always held the opinion stuff like team shooting, crossfire and all of these sort of stuff. You don't, do that as much now on these quicker games. People feel like they need to bump out and get a three piece, four piece, yeah. solo, get the hill, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. But like on games like that, you can really punish people. You spawn out, that's it. You're, 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 you're out the game for like 20 seconds. Game. Yeah, later, like you yeah. scammed one death, you're gone, brother. <laughs> you're, gone. you're spawning in Africa and it's going to take yeah. you about 15 seconds just to even get into the gun, uh, into the play. Yeah. But <laughs> at that point, you're on the heady and I can't do anything exactly. against you. <laughs> exactly. It's way more punishing, I feel like, back then. And the, the lack of teamwork showed a lot, like, showed way higher. But then there's mm -hmm. also the counter argument to that is that maybe they're gonna, they could say people needed teamwork because they just weren't as good. Now they're going to be like, let's say that situation you right. used, they'll be like, oh, Simple just hit the corner and just rip you. He doesn't need anyone to bait for him. Maybe, maybe that's true. Yeah, maybe, but we don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> maybe it was the, uh, the 60 FPS. What was yeah. it? The. The ATF will be where, but maybe. <laughs> yeah, 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 maybe. Okay, so Iceman. <laughs> where did that come from? It, it started in World War II because I started just getting clutches and then I had seen, um, I had seen, who was it? It was some NBA player that like hit some clutch three or did something and started like doing the ice in the veins thing. And yeah. I was like, yo, like I'm going to make that my celebration, you know? <laughs> and then I, after all the clutches or matches, I started doing that. and. It just so happened that the first event is when I was getting all these clutches and all that. Yeah. So it just worked out. So I got it from there and kept it going. So let's explain to some of the viewers. Yeah. How do you deal with the pressure in the game? In in the moment. In the moment. The moment. Yeah. Yeah. In the moment, it's kind of uh you just have to you have to go based off straight instinct. Like mm -hmm. if you of course you have to think in the moment, but there's more instinct than thinking. By the time in those like, clutch scenarios, usually it's a game of milliseconds. Mm. So if you go and you're, by the time you calculate something in your head and then you do something, it, it's going to be too late. Maybe you miss your window opportunity or whatever it is. Yeah. So kind of in that moment, it's like, I don't personally, I don't feel any pressure. I would love to play with like a heart monitor or something <laughs> on and like see if I'm actually like tripping. Because whenever people ask me, I'm like, feel fine like it just feels like a normal day you know a normal moment like whatever it is um but in those moments that's that's the my go-to is i just kind of go off the instinct go off the reaction yeah don't try to like think too much because i feel like i've been playing so long that my brain and my body just knows like what to do you know yeah. just do it you know what i'm saying so when you won't be three yeah yeah the line of accuracy, <laughs> was that just instinct like instinct at the time yeah that was, was like a situation a, exactly it was instinct in the moment it was just like a split second calculation of like okay i have one week my teammate called another person week there's two people week if i don't chow now if i let them regen like the round's over so yep. it was just like a no hesitation decision of all right two people week this is my best chance it's a low chance but this is the best one i'm gonna get i just jumped out and of course they happen to be lined up yep. so like those instant decisions like that is what changes the clutch yep. so you're a high-performing individual, and the consistent thing that you find with high-performing, extraordinary individuals is they have the ability to deal with pressure. Yeah. Almost like pressure. Just, they still feel the pressure, yeah. but they deal with it in a way where it mitigates that. Yeah. So do you, and this is for the viewers out there, do you have any pre-game ritual or any techniques that you use in order to either deal with the stress, pre-game anxiety, anything like that? 
the only consistent thing that I've done for all my matches ever that I've played is I just say a prayer before I play yeah. every time. Right before I walk on stage when I'm sitting in the back, before I go in the match, say my prayer. Yeah. You know, everything's in God's hands at that point. And based off, like, for my faith, we know that everything is written. So yeah. if it's meant to be, if it's going to happen. You got to ask God for the help. If it's not, it's God's plan. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so I want to touch on your religion yeah. uh, briefly as well. So you're a Muslim, yeah, and you're currently fasting for Ramadan. Can yeah. you explain to the viewers what that is? Yeah. So during Ramadan, it's a, a holy month for the Muslims. Yeah. And what we do is we don't eat or drink from sunrise to sunset. It's our dawn to dusk. Yeah. Yeah, don't, no eating, no drinking, no, you can't even put chapstick on, none of that. And it's kind of a month to bring us back to reality. You know, you take away so many things that people like revolve their whole day around or all these other things. And it kind of it humbles you and it gives you perspective on what other people, you know, in other areas of the world are going through in more harder situations. It kind of also shows you the like the the insignificance of like the current world and these current things. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, like you're mad. Some people get mad. Oh, I didn't get this drink this morning. I didn't get this sandwich. I'm like, it's not important. There's way bigger things at play, yeah. and it it very much so humbles you. Gives you a sense of gratitude. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. So then, has there been anything from either the religion or like fasting, for example, yeah. that has given you any in your God career? Or- oh, for sure, definitely. Like discipline mm-hmm. and everything that comes with it. it yeah, because for me, Islam is a very like a religion that has a lot of discipline in it, mm-hmm. and if you if you can carry that discipline onwards in other aspects of your life, it's gonna it can help you. And to me personally, it's definitely helped me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And from fasting too, for sure, like that, because it's a it's a mental game hmm. at that point. So it definitely helps, like work on that focus and just that mentality of being able to, you know, tune things out and take that idea that these things are insignificant compared to the bigger picture. So that makes things like not affect. Yeah. You know what I mean. I think as well what you mentioned with the God's plan is where everything's yeah, out of your exactly. control. Yeah, 100%. So you're in the moment. It's out of your control. If you win or lose, it happens. It happens. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so growing up, did you ever feel like, and this might be different from uh, when I was growing up in the UK compared to the US, but did you ever feel like your faith or the fact that you're not a conventional white person, whatever, did that ever affect your game and career? Did you ever feel like like that i mean definitely before before i don't know if it like affected it it didn't yeah. been affected but just growing up in this country as you know like the child of, of immigrants yeah. and coming in from this faith when you know that 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 terrible day happened so many years ago here in america that since then since 9 11 there was definitely like a lot of mistreatment yeah. slander and etc so that definitely was like a problem, but I guess because it happened when I was like so young that I just grew a thick skin to it and then it just began to not bother me. But I don't it, think it like hindered my career. Okay. Yeah. Is there any sort of advice you can give for someone who maybe look like us? Yeah. Who wants to make it in pro, who's dealing with this sort of stuff, whether it's in school or yeah. in from teammates or whatever, uh, opponents. Yeah. Is there any advice you can give with that? Uh, what I would say is, I mean, they just, they don't know what they're talking about. First, you have to grow the thick skin and just start ignoring them because they're, people are going to be, people are going to say what they want to say. They're going to talk their smack. They're going to try to get under your skin. They're going to try to be disrespectful and you can't do anything about it. And it's better to just ignore them, tune them out than to entertain it or respond or get into it with them and interact. It's just, you're irrelevant. Whatever you're saying, I don't even hear it. I don't care. And you just move on. That's the best plan of that. I think that was one of the biggest mistakes I used to, I used to bite onto that yeah. growing up. And I used to like try and argue back, but then you realize, and especially in hindsight now, in the position that I'm in now, that you're arguing against someone that has probably not a profile for, or, yeah. or like a 13-year-old, yeah, exactly. right? Yeah. They just, so there's no point wasting And they're just coming from such a place of hate that no matter what you say, it's not going to get through to them. Yes. They don't care. That's it. Like just, you're, gonna, you're arguing with the wall at that point. Yeah. So there's no point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, let's move on. Florida. It was Thursday. Yeah. Talk us through what happened. 
talk us through because now you mentioned you mentioned it was a movie earlier. Yeah. This was actually a movie. <laughs> Let's talk about that for the viewers. Okay, so me me and Tom Lynn's right? Yeah. We're, we go, we went to team dinner the night before. We come back to our room and we see like a couple cops at the door next to us and they look at us when we walk in and we're like, okay, that's weird, but they don't say anything. Yeah. And we just go in the room, chill, get ready for bed, whatever. We end up going to sleep. Imagine then- if it was me and you. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> wait, wait. Yo, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so we walk in and we're just chilling whatever we end up going to bed. It's around like eight-ish. AM, I think something like that. Yeah, we wake up to gunshots, and not just like do 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 do. Like they're shooting, like wow. they're emptying the clip, like they're shooting. We wake up. Me and Tom look at each other, like, "Yo, like what's going on?" I'm like, "Yo, get on the floor, get on the floor." So we get on the, we get on the floor between the beds. We're literally like taking cover behind the bed. Wow. The guns are going off, like they're shooting. We're like, I'm like, "Oh, this is what's going on." It's literally the room next to us like bullets could have literally came through the wall probably like, if, yeah if different angles or whatnot happened so the shooting stops and then we're like okay like we get up we're like what's going on we hear the cops yelling talking outside and they're like yo do these rooms connect because you know some hotels yes the, there's a door between some of the rooms so i'm like oh shit like they're gonna come in our room now so they come they start knocking the, i'm in my boxers and a white beater yeah they start banging on the door like police come out. So I start talking to them through the door like, "Yo, officers, like we're coming out. We don't know what's going on. Like we have nothing to do with this. Like we're coming out, hands up." So I'm like creaking the door open, putting our hands out the door, like opening it slowly because they're on edge. Like they just got in a firefight. Uh, they're ready. You know what I'm saying? Shot. Yeah, yeah, like they they just literally got in a firefight. They are ready to shoot. So we start opening the door. They got like the ARs in our face, all types of guns, whatever. We're like, "Yo, like we don't know what's going on. Like we're out of here. Like, come out the room." Start taking us down the hallway. There's like police in there, like blast shields, like yeah. all types, like helicopters. We're just like running down the hall. I'm still in my boxers. I'm gonna tell the officer, I'm like, "Yo, can I get some pants?" And he was like, "Like, do you hear? See what's going on? Like, we've got time for you to get pants." I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> "I'm like, all right." So, <laughs> yeah. so he takes us down to the lobby. Takes us down to the lobby. I'm sitting down there in my boxers. A wife beater. Tom sitting down there. The cops are like one cop staying with us. They're like talking on the radio, like tango down, like all this. I'm like, yeah. no, like, what's going on? You know what I mean? So we get stuck in the lobby for like three, four hours. Eventually, I was like, yo, like I need pants, bro. I can't sit down here in this lobby <laughs> like this. They give me some. They give me some cop pants, it's like size forty six, like this big sticking <laughs> out from my waist. Um, so it was just crazy, and I felt bad for Tom really, especially because. He's from France. I don't think he's ever even seen a gun. Uh, yeah. And then he woke up to that. I was like, bro, like, welcome to America, brother. <laughs> have, you, <laughs> you know? have you seen the body cam footage? Yeah. I saw have you seen it? Okay. Have you seen it? it yeah. They, they, they heard one shot and all three of them. Yeah. They were, they were shooting, bro. So what actually, did you find out what actually happened? Um, What I know, I think it was that like, he like called the cops saying he like killed someone or something, or there was like some domestic dispute or something. So he called the cops on himself. Then well, I don't know if they wanted that. Oh, yeah, did he die? Never, yeah, he died. He, yeah, yeah. But the cop that got hit like only got like a little damage. It wasn't. Yeah, it was like a fatal injury. Yeah. Okay, that was crazy. Let's, let's, that's yeah. Florida fear right yeah, there. Literally, Florida man is undefeated, bro. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on. Um, this is from Ace. So he says yeah. you are very um, particular. With your hands. What is your hand stretching routine? And explain to the viewers why you do that. Okay, so for us, so for me, I, the hand stretches that I do is I stretch my forearms, front and back. Yeah. Like you put your hands on the table, palms down, stretch back. So like this? Yeah, but like you have to stand up. So it's like okay. palms down, you get what I'm saying? Like yeah. this. And then you lean back and it'll stretch out your forearms. Yep. And then you do wrist down like this. So how many of the forearms? Do you do? So I do 30 seconds on each side. Yeah. And then that's what opens up your forms because everything starts up here. Yep. It even starts further up, but at least here, all the tendons and everything in your fingers start there. Yeah. So you gotta loosen that up. Then I'd like open up your wrists. You gotta do like some wrist wrist curls, wrist turns, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Both ways. You gotta open that. I do How like many? I do like twenty oh each direction. And then I do five each direction again to like finish it off. Yep. And that's like the base that I do for the most part. And 
it's just super important because as gamers, like these are the money makers, man. This yeah, is what the yeah. performance is. This is the money makers. Your whole life is these things. So if you don't take care of them, it's gonna you know affect your performance eventually, or you might just have some hand problems that last you a lifetime. Yeah, and that's not what anyone wants to deal with. Because th- that's that's what you'll find is a lot of people, unless it's affecting you right now, people yeah. don't believe. It. Can affect you later exactly. on right yeah. so i don't want to be an old man and i can't like grip something right because yes. like i have some tendonitis or arthritis and also it's a good way to gain consistency because sometimes people i'm sure people watching this get on maybe their shot feels good one day yeah maybe it feels bad one day maybe it feels okay the next day then the fourth day it feels good but they're not realizing that the things they're doing throughout the day or whatever could be causing some soreness tightness and that's what's affecting your shot so yeah. if you have this consistent routine you can try to gain that consistent feel every time you play. You yeah. know what I mean? Consistency and discipline. Yeah. You do every day. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, question. What makes a good teammate? Ooh. What makes a good teammate, right? Yeah. And who's been your best ever teammate? Oh, <laughs> putting me on the spot, so, eh? Uh, okay. You don't have to answer the second one, but what makes a good teammate? <laughs> what makes a good teammate is they have, they have different attributes. So, there's attributes in the game that are really important, you know, like really good comms. Yeah. Not selfish. Following the game plan. So just interrupt. What do you mean by not selfish for the viewers out there? Not selfish as in don't put don't put yourself above the team. Don't put your stats, your needs, your feeling above the team. Maybe you don't like a play, but that's your job to do in this play. Yeah. And it might you might die. And now on the scoreboard it looks like you got blooded, but we, it, it gives a good chance to win the round. Red dot chasing. Yeah, you yes. got you got to do it. And do you know what I'm saying? So like, don't put your own concerns or feelings over the team. And that's the number one for not being selfish. And then being able to follow the plan. Mm-hmm. So go to practice, have a conversation, whatever it is, and actually implement that in the game. That's super important. And yeah. then of course, good communication. That's like what's good communication? Not just calling out red dots. One's here. One's there. This that yeah. actually have coordination. Like, yo, I see no one over here. There's, they're probably going around the right, play safe over there. I'm flanking them, like the yeah. small talk, you know what I'm saying? So, and that coordination, like, yo, grabbing someone off spawn, yo, come with me off spawn. We're going to go do this. Let's clear this out. Actually, the, the comms that matter, like the coordination in the game, just the calling out red dots or calling out that, that's just like very basic. So if you're not doing that, bro, you're not even playing the game. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So, that like just meeting the minimum bar is not good enough. You have to actually. Everything after that is the difference maker. So that's the stuff that you have to be able to communicate and master. So my question to you is everything that you just des- described requires yeah. an understanding of the fundamentals of, a, of a, the macro level, top yeah. down level of gameplay. So for our viewers who are just getting into it, who are I don't know, platinum in ranked or whatever, who don't truly understand the game from a team perspective, yeah. what's the best way to, for them to learn in the moment so you're because you're mentioning small talk yeah. and you're mentioning right let's not chase red dots so let's make the follow the game plan but what does that look like and how do we get there how do you get, so the way you would get there is it's hard to do it in the moment just playing the game let's say if you're a rank play player yeah i would hope that like you have somewhere to watch some vod or watch watch someone else play and then kind of like get the concepts and then apply it to the game because so the way i would do it is like you would play and realize okay let's say for example Yo, this hill, every time I play a ranked game, it's so hard to break. Yeah. You're going to go in there and be like, okay, you need to come up with an idea, come up with a plan. Yo, if I kill this guy on this area, it's going to be easier to break the hill. So you yeah. get in the game, you're going to get your teammate off spawn. The hill pop, we got to break this. Yo, come with me, you're going to go kill the guy on the left. You guys slow play the right or whatever it is and kind of get that coordination level up because yeah. you're going to have to use your experience of, you know, the map and the game and what's going wrong to come up with a plan and like coordinate it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so be proactive. Yeah, yeah, be proactive, and it's. I guess it's hard for these rank play players to do it in the moment of the game because they're playing with different people. It's just no comms, this yeah. and that. But you can be the guy. You can be the guy to do that, and Damn you know, right. get out of there. Yeah. You know. Damn right. Okay. What about out of game attributes? That so the out of game attributes yeah. are big too. So you need to be. You need to be sociable because mm-hmm. you need to have create a good environment with your team. Yeah. Don't be like a grumpy guy. Don't be like to yourself in the corner, like not interacting. Like yeah. that's that's very important. Um, two, you have to be like understanding. Yeah. 
You have to be understanding of people's emotions for the day. You have to be understanding of their, maybe their home situation or life situation. You have to be understanding of just like life in general. And then the third part is, I guess it goes with, with one and two is like build it, being willing and able to build these relationships with the people outside the game. Yeah. Because that translates directly to the game and also translates directly to the conversations you have as a team yes. and everything like that. And if you don't have that, people can take things personally and then, you know, it just starts developing like a, it's like a little poison. Yes. And the poison starts growing and growing and growing. And once that poison gets a little too big, your team's just going to be chucked. Yeah. So that, like these out of the game, these type of attributes and another one too is effort. Always give your effort, like yes. the maximum effort and no one can, once you, if you're doing all that, like no one's going to hold anything against you realistically. Yeah. You know what I mean? As long as you give it 100% yeah. consistently. Not just once, yeah. consistently. Exactly. Or as best as, as you can. Yeah. Okay. Best teammate. <laughs> okay. You've ever had. Best teammate I've ever had? Yeah. You've teamed with a lot of yeah. great, great players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But choose one. I'd have to just give it to Kenny. Kenny? I have to give it to Kenny because I won so many tournaments with him. So I won three tournaments with him and got second at COD Champs. So that's my... I've had the most success with him. By default, he's got to be the best. So are you defining a good teammate as the one you have more success with? Or is there anything extra to that? Mm, okay. Because that's, that, that's what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Hmm. Yeah, I guess so, I am. So success I'm resulted, aside. Yeah, yeah. Success, success aside. aside. Yes. Okay, success aside, who's the best teammate? In their prime, it doesn't, you know, performance aside. Okay, performance, performance aside. Performance aside. Yeah. Who is someone you would team with in the offseason immediately? We, yeah, from, from all the players that you've teamed with. All of them, bro. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny, Dylan, or Tad, yeah. AG, Dante, like, I'd pick up any of them. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, sure. a yeah, <laughs> that's a yeah, good answer. Yeah, Because I've had such good experiences with all of them. Like, yeah. I feel like I've rarely had bad experiences mm. with teammates. It's like, super rare for me, I feel like. Okay. And with all of them, I've had such amazing experiences that that's just my vision, my perspective of it is like, it was all great. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, I see. Right. So, DDL comes around in 2019. Yeah. I think it was 20. I believe you were the first player to be signed by any. Yes. So give insight to the viewers. What does that process look like? Yeah. Do you have any suits? What's it like talking to suits? Because yeah. we never really had suits in COD before, yeah. right? We, we kind of did, but not as intense not, not, as this. Not as, not as billionaires, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Like, not like, not, these are super suits. <laughs> these, are, these are super, yeah, super suits. The yeah. suits, A, B, C. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do a tier list on that. Yeah. Right. So, so what does that look like? For me, um, when CDL got announced, I was kind of, it was towards the end of the Black Ops 4 season, and I had my sights set on like a big market team. Yeah. I wanted to play for either like LA, New York, Toronto, like a big city. I didn't want to go to like the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Because at that time, we were under the impression that you had to live in your city. Yes. For sure. So we were like, I was like, All right, I'm moving. I want to go somewhere cool. Like, I'll at least make it a cool life experience. Yeah. So at that time, it was like, I want to get on the LA team or New York team or Toronto team. And at Black Ops Four Champs, I actually had a meeting with the New York New York owners, my man Farzam. Yeah, and uh, I had a meeting with him, talked to him, and uh, I, I felt I felt good about it. He felt good about it too. Yeah. And coming into the off season was like during they they signed um they signed Bobble and JP. Yeah. And going into it, that's when the roster building process started. And personally, I like to move quick. I want to get everything done soon. Yes. And then enjoy the off season. So once they had their like management set up, uh, had meetings with them and, you know, they wanted me to help them make the team and, you know, go from there. So when I got that offer, yeah. it was a place I wanted to be with people that I wanted to work with. And I had, you know, good meetings and good talks with these people. So from then on, that's when I took the deal. But I had no agent. I, I personally don't like having So you an negotiated agent. Yeah, with Fazan or yourself? Yeah. Okay. I don't like having an agent personally. They're great for... The, they're great for the out of like CDL stuff. Yeah. Phenomenal to have an agent get you deals, brand deals, etc. But when it comes to CDL contract, to me, I just didn't feel right giving them a percentage of that when what are you going to do? You're going to go talk to the guy 
and tell him how much money I want. Yeah. I could tell him myself <laughs> without paying you that money, you know? I, I, I feel you. Yeah. So like, that's why I didn't want to have an agent. There was a couple of agencies that wanted to sign me at that time, but I was like, I've done these negotiations before. I've even negotiated for my whole team before many yeah. times. So like for me, I was like, I'm not phased by this. I, I think it comes to the personality. Yeah, that's true. I think true. when I look at you, you're able, because you've got the experience, you're able to negotiate yourself. Yeah, but that's true. if you're new into the league, some people aren't going to be asking for what they're worth what they're, or yeah. market value based on the market, whatever. Yeah. And so that can really sort of, they're put scared, them put them yeah. off, like scared to like say, okay, I want this. Yeah. I feel like I'm worth this. Yeah. But they won't say it because they're scared. Yeah, that's so. fair too. So that if you have that personality, then it probably is worth it to get an agent. Yeah. But I would say, Man up. <laughs> Man up. Yes, yeah, do, handle it do, yourself. Do it yourself because you'll save a lot of money because esports money is like, it's fleeting. Like you're not, careers aren't long. So let's say you lose 5% or 10% of your contract every year for, let's say the four years you get yeah. to play. That's a lot of money, that's man. Of money. And you're giving, you're sacrificing so much for this esports career that's very short term. Yeah. You got to keep every dollar you can because you're going to, you sacrificed everything to do this for a few years. You're going to need that nest egg to like set yourself up for the future. Yeah. You know? So if you give up, like I said, after a few years, five, 10% a year, that adds up. Yeah. Let's talk about the future. Yeah. You know, God willing, you're nowhere near retirement. You've yeah. got many, many more years. But what does post career look like? When I'm done playing, I got a couple things that I want to do. I think the first thing I want to do is I definitely want to try coaching because uh, I think I'd be good at it. Yes. And it would, I feel like I'd be doing a dishonor to myself to retire and then not at least explore that yep. for a little bit. So I would want to see how that went and see how I enjoy it, see what it's like, yep. see, be on that back end of it, you know, and go f do that. And if that scratches the itch and I enjoy it and everything is good, I would do that while I can, but also kind of in the idea of, like I said earlier, with the family businesses and yep. stuff like that. So. I would have to, you know, try to balance both. Or if the coaching thing is not doing it, I would just, you know, go home and start working on that, like business, real life, yeah. like adult business stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You're a watch guy. Yes. Dream watch. Dream watch. The Nautilus. Blue face. Blue face. Yeah. Put a picture. Juan, could you put a picture on? You got a couple APs, don't you? I got one. You got one AP. I got one AP. Yes. What AP? I got the Royal Oak, the Chronograph. Ooh. With the black face. Yeah? Yeah. Any rollies? No, no, no. No rollies. I it, went straight. My, that was my first big time watch, and I just got the one I wanted. Yeah. <laughs> I've, never, yeah. I've never been a fan of Rolexes. I think they look yeah. ugly. I, I'm not going to lie. The only, the only Rolex I like are the Daytonas. All the other Rolexes, yeah. I'm not like that much of a fan of. But for me personally, too, I don't wear gold, right? So I don't wear gold. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to get a watch that has no gold in it, and it's yeah. the best one I could find, best look. I was like, Whatever, I'm just going to get this, scoop this up, and that'll be my watch now. I want a Richard Mill. You. I want one of them, but they're a bit too expensive. You guys, you guys have to win a couple chance. <laughs> I've got to win a couple more. <laughs> you got to win a couple yeah, more chance. So. Yeah. We'll put, we'll put a picture of that. What do you think? Leave of, a comment of what your guys' favorite watches are. Yeah. You got to see, honestly, your guys' taste, you know? What, what do you think of Hublots? They're good, but, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend the money on it because mm -hmm. it depends. Like, if you're... If you're just into the watch and you're not worried about like the, you're not worried about trading up, trading down like, or reselling yeah. or anything like that, then yeah, you know, get whatever you like. If it looks good, you like it, that's great. Yeah. But I feel like when you're in the watch business, not watch business, but like, Are you in the watch, into watch business? business? No, not in the business. Okay. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> but like, when you're in the watch like market, like you like watches or whatever, eventually you're going to want to trade up for watches. You're yeah. going to go from the AP. You might go to the Richard Miller. You might go to a Patek. You you need unless you're just balling, <laughs> unless you're just balling, <laughs> like you're gonna want your watches to retain value to like sell, keep some money in, trade. It's yeah. just like cars, you know what I'm saying? You get mm -hmm. a car, drive it for a few years, you're kind of over it. If it's a nice car, you can sell it, get some money, put that into another car. So you can like mitigate your losses a little bit. Yes. But if you're just balling, then do whatever you want to do, bro. <laughs> get whatever you want. Fair yeah. You're a, are you a car guy? There's a, a little there's a, bit. There's a picture that I remember. I want you to put it up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that your G bag? No, no, that's not my. Okay. It's family G bag. <laughs> so, you, are you a big car guy? Yeah, definitely. I definitely, I definitely like cars. Dream but, car. Ooh. Dream SF car. Ninety. Car. SF ninety Ferrari. You put a picture of that as well. Never seen that. Before. Yeah. That. What about SUVs? Any of that? SUVs. I like the Urus. 
I yeah. like the years or the the Ferrari trucks coming out. That looks. There's a Ferrari yeah, truck. The Ferrari truck coming out. That looks. Yeah. Is that going to be the next one? You Maybe. win champs. Yeah, you win champs. I'm yo. <laughs> any any Ferrari connects, call me. <laughs> no, I appreciate the appreciate the podcast. Anything you want to say? Any shout outs? Twitter, Twitch, TikTok. If you're doing it. I mean, yeah, just follow me on Twitter at Accuracy LA. Follow me on the gram. Same thing at Accuracy LA. And the shout outs I want to give is just. To the rocker fans, everyone that's been supporting us th- through this year, you know, we've had some trials and tribulations, some up and downs, yeah. uh, but we were hoping to close out the second half of the season strong and we're going to give you guys something to root for and, you know, something to be proud of. Yeah, perfect.